a, a very good friend and a very distinguished uh, speaker today in our uh, monthly talk of the Austin Center in Tel Aviv University, Andy Singleton. Uh, we've been uh, working together for many years and uh, it's a real pleasure to have you with us, uh, Andy, this morning for you, this afternoon for us. Andy uh, is a key player in the uh, genetic uh, aspects of Parkinson's disease for many years. Uh, he was part of the uh, group that uh, uh, discovered the uh, alpha synuclein multiplication mutation and later invo was involved in the uh, discovery of the LARC2 uh, genes role in Parkinson's disease. And since then, he's been uh, uh, extremely active and, and uh, important in understanding the role of genetic uh, uh, Parkinson's disease. Uh, Andy is a distinguished researcher in NIH and leading a very big group trying to understand the genetic aspects of neurodegeneration in general and Parkinson's disease specifically. He's been uh, publishing more than 600 papers on those topics and uh, really playing a very important role in uh, moving this field uh, fast forward. So it's a real uh, uh, honor for us to have you uh, with us, Andy, and to hear you talk today about the collaborative progress in neurodegenerative disease. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Nir, for the kind um, introduction. And um, thank you for the invite to, to speak today. It's really a pleasure to, to talk to everybody today. I hope everybody is um, doing well and is, is uh, safe. Um, so, uh, I, I wish I, I actually wish I was there visiting. I'm hopeful that we can start traveling again um, soon. Um, although, um, given I work for the for the U.S. government, it might be a, might be a while before I'm allowed allowed out of the country. Um, so I'm going to talk today about um, a few different projects and um, really um, the space that I think is the future for neurodegenerative disease, which um, is is really centered around collaborative progress or collaborative um, research endeavors, particularly in the genetics and um, increasingly in the genomics space. I think one of the things that has made genetics really tractable is that it's relatively easy to collaborate. Actually, scientifically, it's, it's very easy. Um, the bureaucracy often gets in the way, the paperwork often gets in the way, but um, scientifically, it's actually pretty easy to, to work together in, in the genetic space. And, and that's growing to be tr true more and more um, in the post-genetic space, the genomic space. So I'll talk a little bit about some, some efforts in, in those areas. So I don't know that I need to, um, I don't know that I need to say this to this audience, but, but why do we take this path? Why are we um, investigating genetics, of course, it's to, uh, in the first instance, it was always to try and garner an understanding about the disease pathobiology. You know, if we have a, a starting point, if we have a concrete starting point like genetics, it should, uh, should inform us on the uh, biological processes in, that, that really are the disease process themselves um, through, through modeling efforts or through intuition, actually, in some, in some um, spaces. But I think the other thing that we've taken to appreciate over the years is that um, there are other parts. It's not just about finding a target and um, a viable therapeutic intervention for that target. We also need to be able to match the patient to the target because Parkinson's probably isn't just one network or one pathway and, and we might want to um, modulate which pathway we're targeting therapeutically based on, based on the patient. But we'd also like to um, uh, apply a therapeutic at the right time. So um, right target, right time, right patient. And I think genetics has a role to play in, in each of those three um, critical, critical elements. So I'm gonna talk about three or maybe four things today. Um, genetic architecture of risk and what we're doing in that space. Um, uh, the same for genetic modifiers. I'm gonna talk a little bit about uh, tool generation in the post-genetic space. And then I'll wrap up a little bit um, talking about a, a fairly new initiative that um, I've taken on at, at, at NIH, which is in the broader neurodegeneration and dementia, dementia space. So I think most people um, in the PD space are familiar with this. This is a study published by our group. 
um, around two years ago. This is really the latest, largest genome-wide association study. A pretty incredible um, number of, of patients and controls. I mean, I think um, um, I certainly uh, don't think don't think too much about these numbers anymore. But when I think historically, where we were 15 years or so ago, where we were doing um, genetic studies in a couple of hundred cases and a couple of hundred controls, it's pretty amazing to see that, that really this type of study now is, is where we're at, where we're looking at close to 40,000 cases and, and um, uh, proxy cases too, uh, and then over a million controls. And when you have this kind of power and when you're able to genotype a fairly large number of samples, you get um, a pretty reliable um, number of genome-wide uh, associated hits. And I think that we have a clear path forward in this space. We know, um, we essentially know that as we increase N, how many additional um, loci we're going to get. But at the moment, we're at around 90 or so um, independent risk loci for Parkinson's disease. There are another um, half dozen or so coming out fairly soon, I would say, um, that will add to this um, list. But we have a pretty cl a clear path forward for um, identifying risk. Of course, we can, we can do things beyond just looking at um, using genome-wide association studies to look at uh, risk, you know, whether you're gonna get disease. You can also start to look at things like, when are you gonna get disease? So, so this is a case-only discovery series. Again, this was published a year or two ago, um, uh, roughly 30,000 cases and um, no controls, so case-only. And really the outcome here is a quantitative out, out, outcome, which is age of onset. Age of onset is not particularly heritable. When you look at uh, risk for Parkinson's disease um, over the lifetime, heritability is about 25%, something like that. So the detectable heritable component is about 25%. The genetic component itself is probably much larger, but the detectable heritability is about 25%. When we look at age of onset, the detectable heritability is only about 10%, something like that, rather low. Um, I think this is, I think it, it probably has a larger heritable component, but um, defining age of onset is really tough, right? It's a very subjective thing, um, um, usually determined by the patient and um, not particularly accurate, I think. However, that being said, when you have a, a well-powered series, you can, um, you can find lo risk loci for age of onset in Parkinson's disease. So of course you see synuclein. I think um, if you are doing anything genome wide in Parkinson's disease and you don't see synuclein, something has probably gone wrong. It, it's a hit for everything it appears and it's almost, a, um, it's almost our positive control. And we have a couple of other hits here, um, TMM 175 and, uh, and, and the GAC locus. Those, these are two very, very close genes at a single locus and um, the APOE, uh, the APOE uh, allele here. Actually, APOE, um, I should say, is, um, is a false positive. So APOE just changes with age. Um, so we see the same association in, in controls. It's, it's unrelated to age of onset in, in Parkinson's disease. So I had always thought that um, the risk loci for, for just risk, the, the, the variants that impart risk for Parkinson's disease were likely to be the same variants that changed age of onset. And there is some good evidence for that. Um, if, you, if you combine um, the risk loci uh, into, a, into a polygenic risk score, individuals with a younger age of onset have a much higher polygenic risk score. Those with a later onset um, have, a, have a lower polygenic risk score. So the genetic burden is greater um, the younger you are. So we wanted to check this at the individual locus level, and this is fairly easy to do. Or simply all you do is you take the betas for risk and you plot them against the betas for age of onset. And by and large, that, that um, relationship holds. You see this clear linear relationship um, between these two um, association studies. But there are a couple of outliers, and I think these outliers are interesting. I don't really know what to make of them, I have to say, but I think they are interesting. And the two that really stand out are um, um, the risk at uh, um, GCH1, uh, so GTP cyclohydrolase, and um, the risk locus at tau. So tau is um, uh, a very strong, the, the locus tau is a very strong um, risk factor for uh, Parkinson's disease. One of the first things to pop up when you do a genome-wide association study. 
that has absolutely no effect on age of onset. Um, so I think this is pretty interesting. I think um, the, the, the risk loci themselves are interesting, but what's not there is interesting too. So taking the, again, the tau locus and the GTP cyclohydrolase, um, they, um, uh, they uh, seem to inform whether, not when you're going to get disease. And I think what this is telling us that is that um, they are a, a, a trigger for disease, not something that um, cumulatively affects disease risk. I think this is interesting from a, from a therapeutic um, perspective. The issue, of course, is that tau um, is a pretty problematic region to deal with. Um, there was a, a very interesting paper just published yesterday on, on tau and dissecting tau expression by Rohan de Silva, um, which I think goes some way. But there's also some interesting work from the same group um, or the same group at UCL, which suggests that actually at this locus, tau is not the gene, but um, a, a gene called Cancel one is the gene. Um, because of the large amount of linkage disequilibrium in this area, it's a really problematic locus to, to, to work with. But um, um, I'm hopeful that some of the long read methods will help us dissect this a little bit. Of course, we can look at other things. Um, so here, uh, again, a paper published in the last year or so, um, doing a genome-wide association study of um, uh, GBA. So taking folks who um, carry a single GBA mutation and looking for genetic modifiers of, of um, uh, glucoserebrosidase um, penetrance. Um, what we see here again in this study, which is uh, roughly 1700 cases, a few proxy cases. So these are first degree relatives of, of people with Parkinson's disease who carry a GBA mutation. Um, what we see here, um, again, synuclein pops up. Um, this clear association between synuclein and, and glucoserubicidase shows up, I think, both genetically and functionally again and again. Um, we see a hit in uh, carnitine palmal transferase, but, but perhaps more intriguingly, um, again, we see this hit in um, cathepsin B, which is a, you know, a, a lysosomal cysteine protease. And uh, a gene that had shown up as a risk factor for Parkinson's disease in previous genome-wide association studies. So irrespective of, um, of GBA status, if you, if you take a, a, a complete PD cohort and you do a genome-wide association study, you see a hit at, at, um, at cathepsin B. And it's one of um, a number of potentially lysosomal associated genes in those genome-wide association hits. Um, so it's, it's pretty, um, pretty compelling that this shows up as a modifier of um, GBA penetrance. Again, you can do the same thing. So we take this genome-wide association study that's done just in GBA carriers, and we compare the betas in that to one that's done in the total population. And you see, by and large, this fairly linear relationship, except for the outlier that is cathepsin B. So cathepsin B is a fairly um, uh, minor risk locus in total disease but a really major risk locus in um, GBA-linked disease. So if you look at, the, um, if you look at the, the risk in GBA carriers, it's about three times the risk um, inferred um, by cathepsin B in the general um, non-GBA Parkinson's disease. And it shows up as significant epistasis. We see it, there is a slight problem with this data. We see it consistently in all of the cohorts we've looked at, except for one of, one of the larger cohorts, which is 23andMe. So there is some question as to whether this is real, whether this epistasis is real. Um, but the fact that you know it's it's one of a few lysosomal um, genes in our original GWAS and it shows up in this particular screen, I think is um, is pretty compelling. So it argues that uh, cathepsin B is more important in GBA-linked disease than non-GBA disease. There is also an alternative, which is that um, there may be a lysosomal linked subset of Parkinson's disease. And what we're seeing in the total PD population when we see a, a hit at cathepsin B, this, um, this um, uh, less strong hit, um, in, in total disease at cathepsin B, is that what that reflects is, a, is a, a larger effect in a subset of PD patients who have a lysosomal linked um, disease. And I think um, this is particularly interesting, suggesting that there's perhaps a mechanistic subtype. Yeah. I will say genetically, we've not been able to establish um, any types of mechanistic um, uh, subtype. 
um, doing things like uh, um, looking for clustered subsets based on genetic identity or um, long range LD mapping to try and define genetic subsets of disease has failed to, re to reveal, at least for common genetic variants, um, a genetic subset of, of disease. So that's, that's great. That's where we are. There are a few, there are a couple of new things coming out, I think in the next few, um, in the next few months. Um, but how do we get further? Um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about the GP2 program, which is the Global Parkinson's Genetics Program. So this is a program supported by the ASAP initiative, the Lining at the Science Across Parkinson's initiative, and really um, administered, but, but really partnered with the Michael J. Fox Foundation. Um, both of these groups have been incredible partners to work with. So uh, for those of you, I, I think probably everybody on this call knows who um, ASAP are, um, but um, just to, to cover this a little bit, um, ASAP is an initiative, uh, uh, um, a philanthropic initiative, um, which is investing a huge amount of money into um, Parkinson's disease to try and um, um, create some seismic shifts in, in, in knowledge. And they're working in three broad areas, um, understanding the biology of PD associated genes, both monogenic and complex, um, looking at neuroimmune interactions and um, investigating circuitry. Those are the three pillars. Um, and I think RFAs for all three of these have gone out and been funded now. There are some strategic objectives underlying these three pillars, supporting collaboration, generating resources and democratizing data. So the GP2 initiative is, um, fits in the strategic objectives really, and as a feeder to the scientific themes. Um, so as I talk about GP2, it's important to recognize that it's really about collaboration, um, creating a resource and um, creating data. So here's our, our mission statement. Not surprisingly, it's to, to really have a dramatic effect on our understanding of, of PD genetics, but really importantly to make that globally relevant. And I'll, I'll touch on that again in a second. So our scientific focuses are on expanding our understanding of genetic risk in the general population, um, accelerating gene discovery. So here, monogenic gene discovery and making all of that um, all of that research globally relevant. So what do, what are we actually doing? What what's our plan over the next um, over the next few years? So you saw the first um, the, the the first slide or second slide. Uh, I talked about the, the genome wide association study, and we had forty thousand or so cases, and we have an idea of, of what we'd find as we progress. Here we aim to, to uh, genotype 150,000 um, cases. I think this will probably more than double the, the number of known risk loci. It should in, improve our polygenic risk scores for um, prediction and, and modeling. It will identify a large number of mutation carriers, probably somewhere in the region of 10,000 or so um, um, mutation carriers. We can look at other things, of course, um, genetic basis of onset, um, progression, of biomarkers, really any feature you can imagine in Parkinson's disease, if the data is there, will have the genetic power to to um, to identify it, and and it will, of course, create a um, a resource in terms of samples, tissues, cells uh, available with um, known genetic background. I think one of the real challenges over the last few years has been in the monogenic space, um, and and oddly enough. The challenge is no longer in finding mutations. It's in uh, it's in proving that they're really pathogenic, that these variants are, are really pathogenic. So I think we've seen a large number of mutations published in, in new genes over the last four or five years. But I would venture to say that the vast, vast majority are, are wrong. Um, they just don't bear replication. And the issue driving that is, of course, that no one individual lab has enough cases to be able to replicate um, very rare variants in a large number of, of um, in a large uh, a population. And we're doing things in a very dispersed way. I think actually handling uh, whole genome sequence data now is pretty straightforward, pretty easy, um, pretty easy to combine um, the, those data. So what we're aiming to do here is to try and plug the holes in that process and accelerate monogenic gene discovery. 
So we'll be sequencing, uh, generating a whole genome sequence on roughly 10,000 individuals. It, it may end up being more than that, I think. Um, so these are individuals who we believe are, are, have a monogenic form of disease. And all of this data will be made uh, available, both for discovery, but also for mining. If, if a group finds a mutation, they can then um, check this resource to, to see if uh, the mutation um, carries weight in other populations. There are a few other things that we're um, involved in too with this type of data uh, exploration of structural variability. So um, we're having some success in reliably calling structural variability from whole genome sequence, but we're also generating quite a large amount of long read sequence now, which I think um, if you've had the chance to, to, to use it is really a pretty um, transformative technology from, from a genetics perspective. Um, there's so much variability and uh, so much structural and repeat variability that we've been missing. And, and I think long read really helps us to, to, to capture some of that. And again, this will provide a resource, um, uh, creating a source for, for patients with um, particular mutations, samples, tissues, cells, brain tissue, et cetera. So the last pillar here is to do those, those two things, but also to do them in an ancestrally diverse um, uh, population. So uh, here, um, we are uh, expanding our work. The vast majority of Parkinson's disease genetics, like, like uh, the vast majority of complex diseases, has been carried out in populations of Northern European ancestry, with some, with some notable exceptions, but um, those are the exceptions. So we aim to really expand our efforts, uh, working with cohorts and, and in some cases creating new, new cohorts um, and Black Americans, patients from uh, throughout Africa, cent South and Central um, America, the Caribbean, East Asia, and Central Asia, um, and these will these will represent cumulatively around fifty thousand new cases. So here, the idea, of course, is um, uh, is to serve those populations. We have to understand the basis of disease, and 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 I think. Um, we have to understand the basis of disease in those particular populations from a genetic perspective. Um, I think that there are some uh, really uh, clear scientific rationales for doing this type of work. Transethnic bind mapping, which um, uh, is one of the methods which is starting to reveal new, new loci. Um, and I think uh, identifying populations with enriched genetic factors will be particularly interesting for um, for. Uh, risk modeling, uh, modifier screens, and actually potentially for for um, the execution of therapeutic uh, the execution of therapeutic trials. Another key aspect of this, of course, is that um, it's not enough just to make uh, genetic discoveries in um, in diverse populations. We also then need the downstream tools that match those populations. So uh, collecting tissues and cells and allowing us to do uh, post-genetic uh, translational work and genomic work in particular in those particular populations is key. There are some uh, structural, um, sorry, I'll just mention the, uh, briefly a few of these studies. Um, so uh, uh, some of these were ongoing initiatives through um, IPDGC and other efforts. So IPDGC Asia run by Kin Mok um, is focused on um, uh, um, Southeast and to a certain extent Central Asia. Um, IPDGC Africa run by um, May Rizik is uh, ta targeting populations across Africa, um, starting most prominently with Nigeria and Egypt. Um, uh, Lux, uh, a large PD is an effort um, by Nacho Mata focusing on um, South and uh, Central America. And so this was an existing effort that really um, serves as an, as an example for all of the other efforts, particularly in um, engaging that population and uh, outreach and um, growing expertise in that population. It's really been an incredible effort and one that we've modeled a lot of GP2 um, work in. And then Lux Giant, which is an effort run by Manu Sharma um, in India, and which, which uh, essentially aims to collect a, a very large number of, of cases. In India, obviously, they're facing some pretty significant challenges at the moment. We have an additional study which we've um, launched with the Fox Foundation called the Black PD Study, targeting Black Americans in, um, in the US. So, underlying 
all of this in GP2. And I think these are these are as important actually as as um, the scientific aims of these structural priorities. So I've talked a little bit about diversity in research, but um, we're focusing a lot on diversity in researchers. There's a, 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 an enormous training component to GP2 where uh, we are training local researchers, local clinicians and scientists in, um, in data science, uh, collection of patients, um, some work on clinical characterization, really so that we're attempting to empower the local population to work on, on um, their data. Of course, working on the data can be quite challenging. Um, when you're thinking about the large resources, the compute resources required to work on some of these data sets, they can be quite substantive. So you not only need the skill sets, but you need the computational resources. So our computational resources are um, kind of centralized, but also very distributed. So they're centralized in that they're um, being executed through uh, a cloud provider and they're distributed because anybody can access them. So our data is um, uh, being made available, but also the compute infrastructure to analyze that data is being made available. All of the analyses that we do on the data will be done in the cloud. All of the notebooks will be shared. All of the data will be shared. All of the results will be shared. So that means that um, as we train an investigator in Nigeria, for example, they are the ones that are running the analyses in the, in the distributed um, cloud. Transparency and reproducibility. This is a very transparent endeavor. Um, uh, as I mentioned, all of the data and all of the resources um, are um, made available. Um, a huge amount of collaboration and cooperation. And, and, I, and really all of this done within the context of, of safe and responsible data sharing. So we've placed a large amount of effort on, um, on adhering to local policies. And, and that's been particularly challenging with the European GDPR, but um, I think we have a, a, a path to deal with that. Um, um, uh, and I think um, the ultimate aim, of course, is to create um, a resource that is actually useful for the broad population. So we have a large group of um, folks on the uh, steering committee and on various working groups. Something fun that we've, um, or it's been fun for me at least, that we've done is that we've paired every senior investigator with a new up and coming um, young investigator. So um, there's a mix of faces that you probably all know and some that, that you might not know. Um, this has been incredibly good for us. It's, in, it's injected a whole um, uh, amount of energy into the project, but also is creating a new generation of, of researchers working in this space. So currently, um, you know, if you were gonna launch a global initiative, I don't think you'd want to do it as a global pandemic hits, but um, uh, that hasn't slowed us down too, too much so far, I will say, because a lot there was a large amount of um, startup in the first year, getting all of the compliance in shape and dealing with all of the sharing policies, all that kind of stuff. We've really started to move into the production phase now, though, um, onboarding cohorts um, and talking with investigators about um, joining the program. That that really will start to accelerate this year. We have around 70 or so cohorts um, uh, um, in the process of being onboarded, and we're generating genotype data now. So the next three years or so, we'll really see an acceleration in, in um, data production and, and discovery. You can... Um, uh, you can, of course, uh, um, reach out to us if you're interested in hearing more about GP2. And, and, and I know that um, we'll be talking with a couple of people afterwards about this. Um, but uh, we also have an up and coming annual meeting in uh, two or three weeks, um, something like that. Um, so if you are interested in, in joining that, please let us know. This That is like a, a very detailed um, data download and, and a chance to get to meet um, other investigators. Um, we have a whole um, list of partners um, who I just wanted to acknowledge here. So what, what about um, moving beyond genetics? How do we um, take the path past genetics? Um, so again, here's the genome wide association study published by, by Mike a couple of years ago. What do we do with those loci when we find them? So something I think that um, has become very standard now, um, a standard as, as just plain old EQTL analysis in, in uh, you know, five or six or seven years ago is to run FUMA and MAGMA. 
So essentially what you're doing here is you're taking all of your genome-wide association hits, you're taking the genes under those hits, and you're looking to see if expression of those genes um, is enriched in any particular tissue. So in this analysis, we show here that um, this is kind of hard to see, obviously, um, because of the small writing and so many data points. But we see that the genome-wide association hits, the genes underneath those um, for the hits in PD, um, their expression is particularly enriched in brain tissue. So pretty much all of these things that are above um, our significance threshold are in brain tissue. And here we have um, uh, cerebellar hemisphere and cerebellum here as, as particularly um, enriched. So that's perhaps not particularly surprising. Um, you, it, it's, it's surprising that you bring these two techniques together and they work particularly well. You know, you're bringing together an unbiased um, gene discovery um, uh, uh, method and an unbiased uh, expression characterization method, and, and they give you an answer that makes perfect sense. Um, PD is a, a disorder of the brain, or at least a neuronal disorder potentially, and it's, um, we see expression of these genes enriched in the brain. I think um, singularly one of the most transformative technologies in the last few years and, and one that I think will um, have an incredible effect over the next um, decade is uh, single cell sequencing. So the ability to characterize DNA or RNA um, in uh, a single cell, um, I think uh, is, is really transformative. So we can take the same approach that we take for um, tissues um, and we can look for enrichment of genes under, underneath GUS peaks, but in, in um, single cells or populations of single cells. So when we do that um, here, we see that uh, the hits for, for PD are enriched in uh, substantia nigra neurons, neurons in the globus pallid, global pallidus um, and dopaminergic neurons. So this is both um, I guess perhaps not too surprising, but also a little surprising at the same time. Again, that, that um, these two unbiased methods give you an answer that makes um, so much sense. Um, um, but I think we've seen also uh, a fair amount of data from other diseases where perhaps unexpected populations have been showing up. So in, in Alzheimer's disease, um, it, it clearly looks as though the genome-wide association hits are not really having an effect in, in neuronal populations but um, having an effect in uh, monocyte populations. Here, what the data is telling us is that um, the majority of effect, not all of the effect, but the majority of the effect um, and cellular context for genome-wide association hits is neuronal. Now, I will say there's some data coming out fairly soon, I think, that would suggest that there are other cellular populations that are particularly important. Um, so whilst this is telling us that if we want to model and understand um, PD risk alleles, uh, a good place to start is dopaminergic neurons. It's probably not the only um, population that we should be um, that we should be looking at. So how do we take this a little bit um, further? So, so one obvious area that we and others are investigating is the use of IPS lines um, with uh, a whole um, variation in genetic um, risk where you're where you're taking a fairly large series of IPS lines and you're using the genetic variability, the innate genetic variability um, from the donors of those IPS lines as the perturbogen for your uh, for your model as the thing that uh, that affects your outcome. And the idea, of course, here is that you take the IPS lines, um, you have their underlying genetic variability, you can tie that genetic variability to a proximal biologic effect. Um, when you do that for lots and lots of variants you can then look for a converging molecular mechanism, identify viable targets, and then of course, test um, the effects of modulating those targets in that, in that very model, which, which led to the identification of the targets. I will say that I think it probably looks something a bit more like this. Again, coming back to this um, point, um, I, I talked about earlier that, that perhaps there's uh, etiologic subsets or, um, uh, uh, um, maybe subset is the wrong word, but but uh, a whole continuum um, ranging from different etiologic, from one etiologic point to, to another, and that we might be looking at um, dominant uh, etiologic effects in uh, different dominant etiologic effects in different patients. So what I think we might study is 
and there isn't one converging molecular mechanism, but there are um, uh, several converging molecular mechanisms. And, and maybe the target is going to be different depending on which mechanism you're, um, is, is the predom predominant driver of your disease. So how do we aim to, to tackle this? So this is a study called the Fandin PD study, which um, we're just finishing now. And um, what this study did was take roughly 100 um, IPS lines from the PPMI study, from the Parkinson's Progression Marker Initiative study. Um, so this study, um, which has longitudinally followed PD patients for uh, eight years now, I think. Um, uh, there's an incredible wealth of clinical imaging, biologic data on these patients. But um, in a subset, uh, IPS lines were also generated. So we took 100 of these IPS lines, actually we took 140, uh, we, we characterized them and chose um, 95 that really were extremely high quality. Um, push them towards a dopaminergic endpoint, um, which is a pretty challenging effort, I will say. And then did a whole series of uh, assays looking at genetic variability, regulatory, regulatory variability, and uh, variability in um, gene expression. There's also an imaging um, component to this, which I, I won't talk about, um, which I won't talk about today. Um, tackling this type of, of, of study, so doing the IPS work at scale is pretty challenging. This was done in Peter Hoyting's lab at the DZ and E in Germany. Um, it has to be done robotically. This is not the type of thing that, that can be done by hand. So um, just generating the cells was, was work in and of itself. The assays that we chose uh, to execute were things like genotype assay to check that the cells were what they, we thought they were and that mutations hadn't occurred. We looked at mitochondrial DNA sequencing. Um, there is also available long read whole genome sequencing, looking for structural variability uh, and short read um, whole genome sequencing on all of the patients that donated lines. Um, from a regulatory perspective, we looked at assays um, across uh, the timeline from day zero, day 25 to um, the, the mature, what we're calling the mature state of the dopaminergic neurons. So we looked at DNA methylation there, small RNA-seq, attack-seq. We also looked at um, single cell attack-seq in a subset of lines at the end um, and uh, high C to look at uh, um, chromosome conformation. Just as I mentioned, single cell attack seek, something, to, something that I think was particularly um, important and useful for us throughout the development of, of um, the FOUNDIN study was, was the development of single cell methods. And um, I'll talk a little bit about why later, but essentially um, because when you push towards a dopaminergic endpoint, the, the um, cultures are, are pretty mixed and you only get a, a pretty small number of dopaminergic neurons. The single cell um, work allows you to um, really look at, uh, at signals in a, a particular cell type. Uh, um, and that can be the dopaminergic neurons, it can be in the immature neurons, it can be in neuronal progenitor cells. It really allows you to, to um, dissect those signals out. In terms of expression, we ran assays on RNA-seq, single cell RNA-seq, long read RNA-seq to try and capture full transcripts. And we did a little bit of proteomics um, too. So um, these data are um, extremely fresh, um, but also available. Um, so uh, uh, we can uh, we saw a, a pretty large degree of variability in um, in the number of dopaminergic neurons that um, we see in the cultures. So uh, these are the cell lines plotted um, across here, and um, the dopaminergic neurons are in yellow. So you can see that um, in our cultures at day sixty five we had um, some cell lines where there were only 10% of the cells were dopaminergic neurons, some where it was close to 50% 50, 50 ra rarely, but close to um, 50%. And these numbers um, were generated by looking at um, RNA sequencing, single cell RNA sequencing data, but they correlated extremely well um, for dopaminergic neurons with uh, TH and just generally for neurons with, um, with MAPT. And then here's some visualization with a UMAP of, of what um, these combined populations look back look like when you break break them out um, using single cell um, single cell methods. So um, we think from the genome wide association.
studies that dopaminergic neurons are um, are the right place for us to look at the right cellular context for us to look at genetic risk. Um, so th this is based on comparing the uh, GWAS, the genes under GWAS um, peaks to single cell expression in mouse brain. That was the, the slide I showed um, 10 or so slides ago. Um, but we know that generating dopaminergic neurons in IPS lines, they're not, um, they're not quite the same as mature uh, um, human neurons. Um, you know, they're, they're relatively immature in their nature. So we need to, of course, check that these are um, a relevant cell type. So we, we've done that in a couple of ways. The first is to, to, to look and see how the transcriptional profile compares from the IPS lines to transcriptional profile of single cells from human brain, from aged human brain, and, and they look um, extremely similar. I don't show that data here. But then we can do the same thing that we did earlier um, where we take genome-wide association hits, we take the genes underneath those, and we look at their expression levels in each of our single cell populations. So each of the populations from, um, from this group here. And what we see here is that um, uh, they're extremely enriched for expression in immature dopaminergic neurons and in dopaminergic neurons. So it tells us those two populations are the correct cellular context in our model to be looking at for, to understand um, expression and to understand the effects of, uh, of um, genetic risk. So again, this data is really fresh, um, but uh, here's an example um, of one particular locus. Um, so in this locus, uh, another gene was, uh, was um, the one that was put forward as associated with, with PD. Um, um, but when we start to, to really delve into the dopaminergic neuronal data, we see that, that really there's only one QTL at this locus in, in the dopaminergic cells, and that's for the CAMLG gene. Um, so it begins to suggest that um, the effector gene at this locus is not the one that was originally, um, uh, originally put forth, but it's this gene CAMLG. CAMLG. G. Um, and when we compare um, EQTL um, association in the single cell with uh, our genome-wide association hits, we see this nice linear um, association here, telling us that the genetic architecture that's affecting expression is the same as the genetic architecture that's affecting um, risk. So it doesn't it doesn't um, say with absolute certainty that CAMLG is the gene at this locus, but it really adds a considerable amount of, of data. So this is just serves as an example of, of what can be done with this type of, of data. All of these data are available on the PPMI website. So if, if you're interested, um, it can be downloaded as, as flat files. Uh, but we've also created a browser um, that will be available in the next week or so um, um, uh, that uh, allows you to browse these data and browse them broken down by uh, genetic subtypes. So um, you can look at uh, gene expression in nigral, uh, in, in dopaminergic neurons in GBA carriers compared to LUC2 carriers um, or in idiopathic PD compared to synuclein. Um, I should say that um, this is really a pilot. 100, 100 uh, lines is a lot, but um, it's a pilot for this type of work. And included in this series, we have somewhere in the region of 20 or so GBA carriers, 20 or so LERC2 carriers, I think four synuclein mutation carriers, and then the rest are um, individuals with varied um, uh, polygenic risk score. We also have been working with um, CZI, Chan Zuckerberg Initiative, um, um, using their cell by gene browser um, so that you can actually do some single cell browsing um, um, too in these data. Um, this is just to say thanks to this particular group um, that have been incredible to work with on the Found in, found in PD project. So in the last um, five or 10 minutes or so, I just wanted to, to talk about um, an initiative that might be of, of interest to, to this group. Um, so this is a new center um, that's been created at NIH uh, called the Center for Alzheimer's and Related Dementias, um, which I am now um, running. So this center was, was born um, out of uh, a really an incredible investment in Alzheimer's and related dementias by the US government. Um, uh, uh, close to $3 billion a year now is invested in um, particularly for, for those um, diseases. Of course, in the, in the intramural program, in the intramural research program of NIH where I work, we have some 
really key um, uh, um, differences to the extramural world. We have incredibly stable funding, great resources. We are secure in our employment. Um, and all of these things mean that um, we can take on projects that uh, are extremely high risk. Um, we can take on projects that are, um, um, are incredibly long, so that can't really be funded in a, a typical uh, life cycle, grant life cycle. And actually we can take on things that are a bit too boring to be funded in the extramural world. So things that don't do well um, under grant review, but that are in, incredibly important. We all know of, of projects that are, that are not that exciting, but, but really are required to move the, the field forward. Um, the last part, which kind of underlays all of these, all of this flexibility is that we have the potential to define our own metrics of success. So, so because we're in the intramural program, we, we can, for instance, say that it doesn't matter if we publish, it's about whether we produce resources and produce findings. Um, I'm not saying that we're not gonna publish, but um, I give this as an example of, of how we can start to define our own metrics of success. So the mission of, of this new center, which is supported by NIA and NINDS is to, is to really accelerate discovery in AD and, and related dementias. And in this context, those are um, uh, frontotemporal dementia, vascular dementia, and dementia with Lewy bodies slash Parkinson's disease dementia. Um, so our aim is to work across domains, um, both disease boundaries. Um, one of the issues I think that we face as a neurodegenerative research community is that um, some diseases are funded by different um, institutes and different bodies, which means that um, the, the research can become a little bit siloed. Um, it's not always the same people that work on Parkinson's disease, that work on dementia with Lewy bodies, that work on FDD, that work on AD. Um, and yet we know there's an incredible amount shared between those diseases, um, not necessarily always genetically, but mechanistically um, a, a great deal um, shared. So we can really start to break down those disease boundaries and focus on a, a central, a, a central um, um, mission. So I think this is the perhaps the interesting part for, for this audience. So the, the, the point of this um, new center is not to create an additional series of labs, um, but rather to create a collaborative research space. So um, this can be encapsulated, I think, in thinking about the structure of the center. So the center will have around uh, um, 150, 160 people in it at any one time but only um, a little less than half of those will be permanent card employees, permanent center employees. The rest, I hope, will be visitors. So visitors from other intramural labs and visitors from other extramural, uh, international, other academic and industry labs. So the idea here is for us to, to create a space where those groups can work together, where an investigator in the extramural world who works in this space or works in a related space or even in a completely unrelated space. If they have an interest or an idea um, um, to investigate a particular aspect of um, these neurodegenerative diseases, they can come and spend time working with us um, um, either actually within the lab or um, remotely collaborating to, um, to work on this particular problem. And uh, the way that we execute our, our efforts in this problem is also a little bit different in that um, much of it is not really driven by individual um, principal investigators, but a large amount of the work is driven by um, expert groups who really serve as um, data, data generation cores, uh, contract research organizations, collaborations with other academic groups and collaborations with, with industry. So really here we have a, um, um, uh, an ability to execute in a way that's kind of similar to industry um, rather than academic um, labs in, in many respects. And similar to industry, we have a lot of checkpoints. So um, we won't keep following a project. If, it, if it's not going in the direction we need it to, we'll, we'll have to kill the project. So I mentioned this already. Um, and again, hopefully this is of interest to, to this group. The types of investigators that we'll have will be um, folks who, who work at CARD, uh, visitors from intramural labs, visitors from um, outside of the intramural program, both national and internationally, who, ha who have an interesting question or an interesting research idea um, to work in this, um, in this particular space. 
our focus is on um, molecular pathogenesis anchored in genetics. That's perhaps not surprising. Um, I don't think that we will spend a lot of time generating genetic data, except in underrepresented populations probably, um, but really a lot of time um, working in uh, understanding the biological uh, consequences of, uh, of um, genetic risk. Um, hand in hand with that, of course, is, is understanding disease subtypes, uh, predicting disease and, and looking at a, um, the biology of progression. Um, we'll also work in a couple of newish areas for me, um, de-risking therapeutic targets. So I think that, that um, one of the things we do as academic labs is to find things that are um, we think are of interest to industry, you know, potential drug targets, and um, just kind of leave them out there because there's a whole series of work that goes between a good target and a company being interested in that target um, that, that isn't really particularly publishable. Uh, and there's not a huge amount of reward for, for, for doing that um, de-risking work. Um, so our aim is to take on some of that de-risking work. Again, trying to tackle things that, that don't ordinarily get tackled outside. Um, the last part is in therapeutic trials. So NIH has a storied history in genetic-based therapeutic trials being the, the first place to, to try a gene, a gene therapy many decades ago. Um, and I would like us to start to embark in that um, space again. Again, and this uh, below we, we have some structural priorities and these are, are again, very similar to, um, to the structural priorities. You'll see a theme to the structural priorities of, of GP2 here diversity, transparency, collaboration, um, making data available and useful to the, to the research community, and really a focus on foundational resource generation. So if, if there's a resource that needs to, be needs to be produced and is slowing down progress in, um, in this space, we want to know about it and we want to generate that resource for the research community. So some ongoing projects we have. Um, the Indie project was just published in Neuron uh, a couple of weeks ago. So this is a project, a really ambitious effort um, to standardize IPS work. So uh, across neurodegenerative diseases, what has essentially happened is that individual labs have created one or two lines and done experiments with ends of two or three. Um, those lines have different backgrounds. They were engineered in different ways. They have different levels of QC. So what we've done is taken um, uh, a single background and engineered in um, uh, mutations in 70 different genes, uh, tagged those 70 different um, genes, knocked out those genes, knocked down those genes um, to create something like 700 daughter lines now. So these are our lines with, um, um, that only differ by their mutation, have exactly the same background. And all of these lines are available to the research community at, at, at um, very small cost. And the next phase will be molecular characterization of, of these lines once we've finished completing, completing their generation. I will say um, we've also partnered with ASAP to produce similar lines. Um, Mark Cookson is the PI on this, to produce similar lines for, for Parkinson's disease. We have a large data science initiative. Um, this is really around democratizing data um, in the first instance and building resources for people to be able to use uh, multimodal data. Uh, we're generating long read sequencing data. So again, this is uh, data that allows us to look at structural and repeat variability in, in roughly um, 4,000 individuals. So this is a, this is a really major undertaking. Uh, AutoTAC project is a project being run by Richard and you're looking at a, a potential therapeutic for, um, for neurodegenerative diseases. We just sponsored a meeting on, um, uh, on post genetics genomics, moving from maps to mechanisms. And we have a, a pretty large training um, initiative. So lots of exciting things going on in this space and, and lots that um, parallel some of the things that we're doing in, in GP2. Um, so this is the building that's being um, built right now for, for the center. And I hope, um, I really hope to see some of you at this, in this space at some point in the future. Um, we're aiming to, to occupy in the next uh, nine months. So I hope, I know this was kind of a, um, covered a lot of ground and um, covered not just Parkinson's disease, but started to get into um, the, the space of some of the related um, dementias, but I hope it was useful. I think um, in summary, I think that there's just an enormous amount of forward momentum in PE genetics. And um, 
the next uh, two to five years, I think our discovery is really just going to go through the roof and, and, and actually be more robust, um, which, which I, I think is particularly um, important. And I think our path is fairly straightforward there. We kind of know what we need to do and we just need to work together as a community to, to achieve it. Um, I see incredible opportunities in the post genetic space. To my mind, the most powerful thing about genetics really is its, is its um, unbiased application and more and more its ease of application actually. But, but the fact that you, know, you kind of look at everything or you look at signposts of everything. And, and so the, um, the answers you get are um, not necessarily the answers you were, were looking for. So, so I think one of the issues with um, simple reductionist science is that we ask a simple question and we're interrogating that question. Whereas in genetics, we're asking an extremely broad question and just seeing what, what pops up. I think that model is becoming more and more true now in the post-genetic space, particularly in genomics and single cell, single cell genomics, transcriptomics, more and more in proteomics as, as that technology becomes um, um, more reliable. So uh, I think not only have we accelerated genetic discovery, but we'll start to accelerate this funnel of taking genetics and starting to to winnow down to um, um, not necessarily a single mechanism, but um, a, a group of mechanisms that we can start to target um, using, using traditional reductionist methods, which definitely shouldn't go away. They're important, um, but they're not necessarily good at um, taking 90 hits and understanding what the basis of those 90 um, complex genetics hits are. I think this is an incredibly exciting space to be with some, with some really transformative technologies. Uh, and lastly, um, I think that uh, both for CARD and for GP2, um, what we're really trying to do is create a, a space, um, a space and, and in some respects for, for CARD, a physical place to, to leverage these new um, advances and new opportunities to really accelerate research. And, and we hope to do that both in, in the space of Parkinson's disease and in AD and, and related dementias. So with that, I will, um, I will stop and I would be happy to take any um, questions. Thank you, Andy, for, for this uh, fantastic talk that really uh, sharing with us uh, an amazing uh, uh, activities that uh, under your leadership are really taking us to new uh, areas in genetics and post-genetics spaces. Uh, really highly appreciated. Uh, this talk is open for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, I'm Amos Korchi and I don't think we've ever met, but I followed your work for, since you were uh, still in the UK. Um, I, I think that uh, this is an amazing thing uh, uh, drop the force that you showed us about uh, what's happening. Uh, and I want to concentrate on the GWAS issue. And I had a debate uh, with uh, against John Hardy a couple of years ago in, uh, in uh, Coney. And, uh, and they raised some points which also, uh, this was about Alzheimer's disease, but it also reflects uh, to Parkinson. I think the main issue or one issue is that uh, uh, your work is unreproducible. Because as you said, you know, you accumulated so much data that anyone cannot really undermine it. And, and some of it may be wrong. And how do we find out what is right and what is wrong? The, base, the problem I have is that Parkinson disease is not a disease. There are many diseases. What you are collecting are DNA samples from the, depending on the phenotype. And we all know that the phenotype is wrong in many, time, many times, particularly in the situation that you are collecting data when patients have not been followed up uh, frequently for a long time. And some of them may turn out later to be other things. And uh, maybe 10% of them maybe uh, turn out to be, uh, I don't know, PSP, then it will of course uh, raise a signal, a P PSP signal, uh, which you misinterpret as, as Parkinson's disease. So I think this, uh, so for me, uh, the uh, uh, LARC2 and GBA uh, disorders are two different diseases with similar clinical phenotype. But if you, if you say that in those two entities, 
you find similar genetic markers in the GWAS, then this, mean, this means that these are downstream elements. These are not upstream. If the upstream is... Uh, so Amos, Amos let's okay. end the answer. Okay. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there. Um, so I think I agree with you, but I have a slightly, I guess, more positive. I think I have a slightly more positive take. So, and, and I think that um, actually your, your point about things being wrong and there's potential, um, there is, uh, uh, there's there's potential for misdiagnosed cases. I think those are those are kind of related because they both speak to to n, right? They both speak to 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 um, number. So small amounts of um, small amounts of contamination with uh, with a different disease aren't really too much of a problem for your individual signals, right? They reduce your power a little bit, but, but it's not too much of an issue. But you could conceivably start to see things that pop up in those small contamination groups that are not relevant to the rest of the group. And this essentially is the argument you're making, um, I think, about um, there potentially being subtypes of disease. And, and I agree with you completely. I think that there are potentially um, um, genetic subtypes of disease. But um, Perhaps subtypes is the wrong word um, because I don't think that there's ne that they're necessarily completely distinct. So, so you raised the example of GBA and LERP2, right? Um, we can, of course, I showed I showed a um, genome-wide association of GBA penetrance. Um, we've done the same thing for LERP2 penetrance, and you see the same modulators, albeit with slightly different risk. Um, effect sizes, but you see the same modulators in LERP2 carriers that you see in GBA carriers. So there's something similar going on there. Um, and I think there is, that certainly tells you that um, clearly they're clinically a bit different, right? LERP2 and GBA are clearly clinically a bit different and maybe the pathways are slightly different, but they have the same genetic modulators. And therefore anything that we can understand from those genetic modulators should be generalizable across both groups and probably generalizable across um, um, other, other populations. So, so I think I agree with you, but I wouldn't stop doing what we're doing. I still think we're able to get useful information, but we need to be aware and conscious of the fact that as we get more power, we might be able to start to subset out disease and look at the genetic influence on, on sub, sub types of disease. So I think you're right, but we should still continue. I have a question. Uh, Neil yes, is I'll, I'll be, I'll be go ahead. Time. Okay, Andy, first, uh, uh, thank you for the this, uh, wonderful lecture. And I, I tell you, the, the initiatives you are taking are, are overwhelming. Of course, they are moving the field forward substantially. I want to ask you, so now, we are now in Israel, you know, studying our Ashkenazi population. And, uh, uh, until now, the Ashkenazi population was of interest because of the role of LARC2 and GBA uh, in those in this population. But now you are you are you are looking behind these genes. You are looking uh, uh, toward 150 samples. You're doing to the east, to the west, to the South America, to Africa, to everywhere. How do you? What, what, what's, I, have to, I have two two uh, uh, questions principal way question. First, are you still seeing a role for continuing study our st Ashkenazi population in face of this huge number of, of patients that are going to these studies? And second, how you make sure that small populations like ours are not going to be diluted and, 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 uh, and ignored and you know, not ignored uh, uh, personally, but ign uh, and the results and the potential results could be ignored when you when you when you take this huge uh, amount of uh, individuals into one study. Yeah, I hadn't thought about being ignored because I can't imagine a situation where that where that would happen, right? I mean, I think that um, our our um, our notion is that 
uh, you know, a high tide floats all boats, rises all boats, that, that um, the more power we get across populations, the more insights we're going to be able to garner in individual populations. So, so certainly the idea is to look at genetic risk across all of these populations, but I think um, that will always go back, will always return to what does it mean for this particular population? Um, what, what insights can we garner in this particular population? So I don't think that that, that it will lead to any, um, any ignoring of a, of a particular group. And I can't imagine a situation where um, Ashkenazi Jewish population wouldn't be um, a really formidable player in um, the genetics of, of Parkinson's disease. I mean, I think probably more than any other population group, um, this group has contributed to, to, to PD genetics, the understanding of, of, of um, PD genetics. And let's say there's no other single gene in the Ashkenazi Jewish population, no other single drive, driving gene. There's so much that still needs to be done in looking at GBA modifiers or, or LERP2 modifiers. And, and of course, that's the population to do it in. So I think there's an enormous amount of work to be done. And, and uh, um, yeah, I can't imagine ignoring your population. I'm not ignoring, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about diluting that the results will not, will not pop up in face of this huge number of, of individual testing. Well, so of course, what, what, what we're effectively doing is increasing the N at each individual population, right? So each individual population will be analyzed by itself and analyzed together. So, <laughs> so th there'll be no dilution in that respect. What we might see though, is that um, variants, particular variants that are important in the Ashkenazi Jewish population are not as important in other populations and vice versa. Um, so. Okay. Can I ask a question? Um, yes, please have it. Hi, so uh, thanks for this exciting uh, uh, research and programs. Uh, I've seen that most of the mechanistic uh, programs are around the dopaminergic neurons. And, and my question is, is uh, if you can comment uh, about uh, looking on other neuronal populations that are affected early in the disease, such as the sympathetic autonomic neurons that we know that they are uh, affected uh, early in the prodromal state and they are believed to transmit the disease to the brain. So maybe the mechanistic studies should be focused not only on the dopaminergic neurons, but on other population uh, other, uh, outside the brain. If you can comment on this. Yeah, no, I think it's a really good point. Um, um, when you look at the single cell data, which has kind of guided us towards what neurons we should start to look at, the piece that's really missing is um, neurons from the enteric nervous system. So, so we actually can't tell if our signals are enriched in enteric neurons, for, for example, which might be a good, a good place to, to start. I will, I will, so I'll say a couple of things about that. Um, First, uh, dopaminergic neurons are not the only cells that we're looking at. Um, so there's also a program looking at um, astrocytes, um, you know, not a neuronal population, but, but, but nevertheless. And I think those might end up being important. I do think the other space, the, the other place that we need to invest time and effort in is in creating um, uh, an atlas of cell types of interest for um, Parkinson's disease. And actually, maybe this is just better done at scale for all diseases. So what we really need is good reference data for the sympathetic neuro, for the sympathetic system, for um, the enteric nervous system. We need to just create this data and, and then we have, then we can make data driven decisions, right? Um, those, those neurons are certainly important in disease, but are they important for um, the genetic effects that we're trying to model? And we can simply answer that by looking for enrichment of expression. So I think we, we need to just generate the data in that space to, to be able to, to decide whether to, to model those or not. And if, if I can uh, ask, uh, it's clear that the, 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 the biggest risk factor as you've started your talk is aging. And uh, yeah. the, 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 the interaction between the, all those genetic uh, uh, aspects and uh, the normal aging or the accelerated aging, how does that uh, become one picture in all of the diseases you are looking at? Alzheimer, 
and anything else? Yeah, I really wish I had a smart answer for you, um, but I don't. Um, I don't. I mean, clearly, it's it's. I work for the Aging Institute, and it's pretty difficult to define what aging what aging really is. You know, you know how what do we mean by by aging? I mean, I can say that we're starting to try to incorporate it into some of our modeling efforts. Um, uh, so it's particularly challenging in the IPS space where you're mark, where you're wiping epigenetic marks that that you know are are part of aging. Um, but we're starting to try to to, to model that. I think. Um, I think looking at per perhaps a space to start to investigate this is again in creating reference data in aging populations and looking at looking at the coalescence between genetic risk for disease and what changes do we see in gene expression at those um, genes or epigenetic marks of those genes in the aging population and in the aging brain. That might be one way to start to, to, to get at it, I suppose. But I don't. I really don't have a good a good answer for you. It's it's one of those things that um, I think we all agree is a problem, but don't really know how to address it. Can I have a question? Do you have some time? Okay. Yeah, uh, hey, hey. Uh, first of all, thank you for the great lecture. Um, kind of following uh, Avi's question uh, about the energetic system and the expression there, um, did you ever uh, test for expressions, uh, for gene expressions after a um, um, significant uh, life event or um, mm. definitely is, is following the, the evidence we have of, of, uh, of the break of the beginning of the begin of the disease or or, um, or uh, some progression of the disease following these events and and looking at the neurogenetic expression there um, so the simple answer is is no the short the short answer is no but um um i think it's a really good point and it kind of related to the aging point as well right we, we ignore these these other things that are going on like I, you know i talked about the heritability of of pd being 20% and that there is it's probably the genetic basis is probably much larger than that but but that still means there's some other stuff right there's environment or stochastic events that are affecting disease and we're kind of ignoring those um i think um i think that we can certainly start to look at other life events or other influences in the context of genetics so um some very simple stuff has been done in, in the genetic space, looking at life events like um, uh, um, major head injury and the interplay of genetics with major head injury and risk for, for Parkinson's disease. And there's clearly some pretty interesting stuff there. Um, hard to model that in a cell system, of course, or um, toxicant exposure and um, the effects of genetics by toxicants. So I think we can look at those genetically, but we can also start to model them a little bit in cell systems. So um, one of the criticisms of cell systems are that, you know, you're looking at things in a very controlled environment and maybe you need a second hit. You need something to stress cells out or, or um, uh, stress their reaction out um, so that you can really reveal what the biologic basis of the genetic risk is in a more, in a more faithful manner. And we're starting to do things like that. So um, in the found in study, um, the, one of the plans for the next phase is um, to increase N, to um, go into different cellular subtypes, but then also to look at um, exposures and stressors. Can you stress the cells out and see what happens? So that's what, that's one area. I don't know of um, any groups in the PD space looking, to, to get back to your specific question, of, of looking at expression in any cell systems after um, a significant life event. There's probably a fair amount of work going on in this space in um, in the TBI um, in the TBI area, I would guess, looking at gene expression um, after traumatic traumatic brain injury. Not quite the question you were asking, but I think it might be revealing in terms of what does a major event lead to in terms of changes in in, in gene expression. And it's just an idea about a near question before about aging. So Parkinson is an aging related disease. So aren't the genes or the hits that you find 
that related to age at onset are not those that theoretically are pushing the aging process or beating the aging, the normal aging process? Um, I don't know. I don't know whether they're related to the aging process per se or just related to dealing with an initial insult, right? Are, are they um, are they part of a quality control machinery that's just you know helping you deal with a particular insult? And I don't know whether I would call that the aging process. Maybe the aging process has a has an effect on that quality control mechanism. So maybe they're kind of indirectly related, but um, I feel like they're 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 different. Um, so in yeah, your QA, in your QA think... study, the, your control group were patients, the people, normal people. Shouldn't you also have a control group with other neurodegenerative diseases, for example, Alzheimer's disease, to see what is specific to Alzheimer, to Parkinson or to Alzheimer, and what is common to aging or to neurodegeneration in general? Yeah. So the, so we've done this. Um, this has been done by us and quite a few other groups now, um, specifically comparing PD and AD. And um, what you see is not a lot of similarity um, genetically. You don't see a lot of similarity. You see some similarity, are, uh, and I don't know that these things are shared, but um, around uh, HLA region, for example, HLA region shows up in both, but it's maybe different subtypes of HLA. But you don't see a lot of shared genetic risk um, the space of shared genetic risk between PD and AD is dementia with Lewy bodies. That kind of fits, sits in the middle, frankly, um, carrying both some of the major PD risk factors, but also, you know, APOE and, and um, 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 some of the more prominent AD risks. Okay, Andy, I think uh, we've uh, reached a point that uh, we should uh, thank you again for, for uh, being with us and sharing this amazing work that uh, is uh, going under your leadership. It's, it's really a fantastic uh, move forward. Uh, good luck first to you and your, all your initiatives and we would be happy to be part of it in many different ways. Uh, thank you very much. That's great, Nir. Thank you so much. I really hope that you'll, I'm sure you'll be a part of it and I look forward to talking with you and I really look forward to actually catching up in person at, at some point. Um, that would be really wonderful. So thanks, thanks so much for inviting me. I really, really enjoyed this. Thank you. Thank you. Take care. Bye. Bye -bye. Thank you.